The Tigers lose big on deadline eve. We will talk about everything happening on and off the field for Detroit all today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Tuesday, July 30th, 2024. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily, daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash MLB and use code, all lowercase, MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Welcome in. Welcome all. Happy Tuesday, everybody. The Detroit Tigers lose 8-4 to four, thanks to a Winsiel Perez ninth inning pinch hit home run. Uh, also, I have like notifications on for like every single beat writer in within a 5 million mile radius of Detroit. So if I am like checking my phone or if I look over and make t- <laughs> look to make sure the Tigers didn't make a trade while I'm in the middle of the recording, I apologize in advance, but I have to make sure that that isn't a thing. So like right now, for instance, the Brewers just acquired Frankie Montas from the Reds right now. Uh, in in my world so I yeah just that's gonna happen I apologize in advance it shouldn't affect too much Tigers lose eight to four uh to the Guardians on Monday night they are now 52 and 56 on the season we have a lot to talk about off the field and on the field was not a very exciting baseball game uh they got absolutely smacked uh a guy made his major league debut actually two players Made their major league debut, one on the mound, one behind the plate. And it all in all didn't go very well for your Detroit Tigers. It was not a very close or competitive ball game, really from start to finish. This was never a nail biter. Cleveland punched Detroit in the mouth early. They got to Bo Brisky. I guess that's where we'll start. He didn't look very good in this one. And he his stock in you know, my evaluation of of what his season was is just absolutely plummeting. And that's obviously a direct correlation to him struggling mightily uh, as it goes on and on, as the season rather goes on and on. He goes two-thirds of an inning, gives up three earned runs. His ERA is now five on the season. It, it, it's just it's it's frustrating because he he his fastball is better in the bullpen. His changeup is really good. It does not matter because he doesn't have an effective pitch that moves horizontally. I, I am a broken record. I've been saying this not only for all of this season. I think for like two calendar years now, we've been talking about this. I, I don't want to keep saying this every single time this dude takes the bump. But like I'm, I'm not really sure. Like it's just the same point over and over again. Like it, it reigns true nearly every time he goes out on the bump. He got off to the hot start this year because the velocity was way up when they told him he was going to be a pure reliever. I'm glad they told him. Like you know, there was none of this. What they did with Alex Fiedo too, where it was like, oh, you're a starter one day and you're a reliever the next. Like I'm glad they they let him just focus on being a reliever. But none of this conversation, none of it matters if if he doesn't get a slider or a curveball or, or a cutter. I don't care what it is. Anything that moves right to left. Anything. Literally anything. Like he has a slider. It's, it's not an effective major league pitch. And, and that's going to continue to be kind of the talking point with him for the foreseeable future. Um, then you have... Brian Sammons making his major league debut going seven and a third, five runs, five strikeouts, three home runs against two of those three are off J Ram. Does that even really count? Like if you're a tiger and you give up a home run to Jose Ramirez, it's almost like a rite of passage. It's almost just, it's so expected that it's not even like, I don't even count that against him. Like 
We could have put out anybody. We could have put out prime Justin Verlander, prime Max Scherzer. Tarek Skubal could have been on the bump today. It doesn't matter. Like, J-Ram was probably going deep. <laughs> it's just how it is, unfortunately, for the Detroit Tigers when they face J-Ram. But all in all seriousness, this was such a weird outing. I didn't even want to really put him in what went wrong, to be completely honest with you. That's – I don't even know if I said. We're starting the show. Um, I, I – I, I don't really want to even put him in this category, but, you know, at the end of the day, gave up five of eight runs that the team gave up, and, and the Tigers were, again, not really close at any point in this ball game. Uh, but he threw a ton. How many pitches did he end with, man? It, it had to, 96. He threw more than Bybee, who started the game for Cleveland. He threw the most pitches of any pitcher in this game for either team, and he was the reliever technically. Um, I, I actually thought the stuff looked pretty solid, to be honest. I, I really liked the cutter. That thing got up to like upper 80s, even borderline 90 miles an hour at one point. I thought the cutter was a really good pitch. The fastball, you know, mid-90s uh, to lefties especially, that sweeper slider thing I thought was really effective. Like I actually liked the stuff. It's just you see he gave up five runs in seven and a third. And, like, that's why he's at the end of the day, right, you see that good of stuff. And at one point I was kind of like, oh, like, why why is this a 29-year-old making his Major League debut? Why is this the first time any of us are seeing him at the Major League level? And and then, he, you know, you you see why. And it's the consistently consistency of command and uh, and ju really just the consistency of stuff all throughout. But again, like I actually thought th this was a, a fine outing, right? I, I, I didn't have too much of an issue. That they gave a guy who's never pitched in the majors before over seven innings and almost throwing 100 pitches out of the pen. Like I'm not really sure what we all expected. This is more, this has far less to do with, with Brian Sammons and far more to do with the situation that this organization finds itself in when it comes to pitching depth. This guy, it, it didn't matter if he got popped for 10, he had to stay out there because we don't have any other pitchers that are available. They're, they're all depleted. No one can pitch. There, there, there's, there, it, we're, we're toast. We're absolutely cooked. This rotation it is buttered toast. So, like, I, honestly, I give a lot of respect to him. I thought the stuff looked pretty good. I think it's a little bit of a, a a dog performance, to be completely honest, to go out there for as many pitches as he did and and wear the homers, face some of the best hitters in baseball again, J Ram, and and come out of that. Like I I actually give him all the respect in the world. I didn't even want to put him in in you know the side of things uh, that that went wrong in this game, but I feel like statistically you still kind of have to. So there you go. Like again, this isn't on him. Like this is this is <laughs> what happens when you have two healthy pitchers and you're probably trading one and he gets scratched before the game. You, we have one pitcher in our rotation right now. And there's a really good chance that after 6 p.m. today on Tuesday as you're listening to this, we're going to have one healthy starter. That that's that's where you find yourself. Matt Manning's not healthy. There's no one you can like call up it's going to be Tarek Skubal. I guess we can include Cater Montero as well because he's, I mean, he, again, he has to be at this point. So I guess there's two. But again, like you're, you're absolutely cooked in terms of uh, innings, <laughs> just in general. So uh, honestly, like tip of the cap to, to Brian Sammons. I, I, I think he honestly was doing the Lord's work and probably – saved the Tigers' ability to have one of their 93 bullpen games this week by going as long as he did because there's that many days in a week for sure. Okay, let's keep going. I want to talk about the offense, talk about the lineup that is not in a very much better situation than the rotation at this point. We will do that right after this. Got a telltale today about our friends over at Supply House. Get supplies from the site that is made for the skilled trades. Supplyhouse.com. Supplyhouse.com is the reliable way to order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical products online. Their easy-to-use website is packed with helpful resources and the latest product info to help you get the job done right. 
You can shop a complete inventory of over 200,000 parts for over 400 top brands and get your order delivered right to your door with fast shipping from coast to coast. If you need help with an order, you can get expert support and industry-leading service from the friendliest folks in the business and talk to a real person every time. Pros in the skilled trades can get a competitive edge by joining SupplyHouse.com's free Trade Master program. Every Trade Master gets access to a dedicated phone line, free shipping, and discounts on every order. So join the thousands of trade pros already benefiting from their free membership at SupplyHouse.com slash TM and order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical supplies from anywhere with just a few clicks at SupplyHouse.com. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate y'all so much for tuning in, as always, making us your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will, of course, be back tomorrow recapping the trade deadline, talking about the game as well. We have an off day on Wednesday, so we'll see what we talk about in each day. We'll obviously talk about the, the biggest deadline stuff tomorrow, though. Also, be sure to check out Locked on Sports Today, a free 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. You can check it out for free. Again, subscribe on YouTube or check it out for free in the Amazon Fire TV channels app. Okay, so talking about what went wrong in this ballgame, the pitching obviously gave up eight runs. Uh, the offense scored four by the end of it, which does not look that bad on paper. However, they were shut out through six after getting shut out in a whole game on Sunday. So they did go 17 consecutive innings without scoring a run. So not actually great. And the ninth inning runs, the two they scored in the ninth, were very garbage time. No, it was off of Gaddis, who's a great reliever for Cleveland. Um, but it was a windshield press pinch hit to run homer that did not ultimately amount to anything. I guess you could argue none of the runs amounted to anything. I guess you could argue any runs that are scored and the loss don't amount to anything. So we're going to drop that argument entirely. Regardless, not a very great offensive showing, despite the fact that at the end of the day, they put up four runs. Um, I mean, just look at the lineup, right? I, I'm not even going to like break down the, why they struggled and, and whatnot specifically. Bybee's good. He's faced them three times in the last three weeks. So... And and he hasn't been facing the same lineup every time. And that's not a, like AJ Hinch platoon thing. That's everybody is hurt. And we're calling up, every, like, look at the lineup they rolled out there on Monday night. Matt Veerling, Colt Keith, Justin Henry Malloy, Mark Canna, Bly Madris, Dylan Dingler, Zach McKinstry, Gio Urshela, Ryan Kreidler. Th that is going into this outing. The best OPS on your team was 720, 743. Sorry, Matt Beardling at the top, 725, Justin Henry Malloy. Malloy, been hitting way better the last few weeks. Colt Keith, been on fire, right, for about a month. Matt Beardling, we talk about his weird season all the time. Above league average hitter, though. Outside of that, it's Mark Canna, who's struggled mightily outside of the month of April this season. Bly Madris, who was in the minors all season. Gio Urshela, whose OPS is almost back down to under 600. Ryan Kreidler. And Zach McKinstry. That, that is, and then Dylan Dingler, who's literally making his major league debut. <laughs> it's not a competitive team, man. We can call it what it is. They're, they're going to sell today. They probably should sell today. And if you want to blame the injuries, if you want to blame the lack of depth, I don't care what you point your finger at and say this is the reason why. At the end of the day, no matter how we got here, this is where the team is. They have one healthy starting pitcher that they came into the season with. And Bly Madris is hitting like middle of the lineup for this baseball team. And Zach McKinstry is playing every day. And Ryan Kreidler is called back up to the majors, et cetera. I, I can keep going. So that's why they're selling. That is why. Because this is where we're at. It's not great. Um, 
let's let's keep going though. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for what went wrong. What went right? Not a very long list. Again, they they kind of got dominated. To be honest, I, I I know four runs isn't like a complete blowout, but if you watch this game, this was not a competitive baseball game at any point. <laughs> Again, literally from first inning on. At, at, there was not a single at bat in this game that I thought, wow, like we have a chance to maybe make this close. This was a completely uncompetitive baseball game by the Tigers. Uh, Dylan Dingler, definitely on the side of things that went right. However, he goes one for three with a walk. So he gets on base twice in his major league debut. Uh, I thought his at bats were really solid, to be completely honest with you. Um, I really liked what I saw from him. I like his mechanics too. Uh, just, this seems like a really smooth, easy, repeatable swing. There's not a lot of moving parts to it. Um, just uh, kind of generic, which is like, a, a. I'm saying that in a positive light, I'm not, tr- that's not a negative connotation. Like it's, it's just kind of a, a generic stereotypical swing. And I think that that's something that assuming his timing is down, his pitch recognition is down, can probably work at this level. I, I really like what I saw from him in this game and then Colt Keith I thought put together some good ABs he only ends one for five but continues to just put the bat on the ball the zero strikeouts in this one was kind of hitting it to all fields as well uh he had the one kind of blooper uncompetitive one but outside of that thought he put together some good ABs as well uh then Winsteel Perez obviously with the pinch hit home run credit where credit is due there uh, again made it a much closer game there later um, didn't again ultimately amount to anything. However, um, good to see Winsiel Perez not in the starting lineup. I, is anyone opposed to Winsiel Perez getting some reps in the infield again? Um, I, I'm not saying you should put him at like major league shortstop. That's probably a little far fetched, but I don't know, man. Like, uh, especially in these last two months, if if you do go like hard sell, like. Why not see if we can make this dude like able to play five or six different positions? I don't know. Anyway, stuff. Let's get to what you actually want to talk about. Okay. Cause this ball game, again, not the most competitive thing in the world. Um, Dylan Dingler, major league debut, talked about it a little bit. Uh, AJ Hinch before the game in media availability said that he's going to catch a lot and he has zero concern with anybody in the pitching staff throwing to Dingler. Music to my ears. We've known this about Dylan Dingler. He is a very, very solid defensive catcher and a lot of pitchers and coaches at the minor league level have raved about his game calling as well. Now we'll see if that translates to the majors. There's plenty of guys that can do those things in the minors and can't do the majors, but um, I've seen nothing in a one game major league sample size that leads me or, you know, makes me super worried about that being a long-term thing. So we'll keep an eye on it. We'll see, but I am really, really excited about this. A, just catcher bias that I have in general. I, I love catchers and so I'm I'm pumped just to see the debut of a catcher but I, I hope he plays a ton to be honest like Carson Kelly's gone Jake Rogers hasn't hit super well Rogers is obviously going to catch every Tarek Skubal day but and and probably when just when you face lefties but I, I would really not mind if Dylan Dingler caught like the rest of the time <laughs> um and and granted like that's a righty that you're not letting face too many lefties if you'd go like really strong platoon there but just in general um, I, I really just want to see as much of him as possible the rest of the way. I'm uh, I'm very intrigued by him. Again, he crushed in Toledo. I thought he looked pretty good. He was a little late on some fastballs. That's to be expected. We talked about that. Um, but uh, I thought he looked really, really comfortable behind the dish. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping we see a lot more of him the rest of the way. Okay, we got some roster moves to go over. We will go over all of those and then obviously talk about trade deadline day, which is today. We will do all of that right after this. Got to tell you all about our friends over at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest way and most exciting, goodness way to play daily fantasy sports because unlike other apps on prize picks it's just you against the numbers all you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in you can get in on all the daily action with your friends and become a a part of the prize picks community today you can also now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks you can turn 10 bucks into a grand again with just four correct picks over at Prize Picks, there's a lot of fun uh, baseball stuff to get in on here. Obviously, 
with, uh, again, starting pitching strikeouts. I talk about all the time, but they have so much more. Stolen bases, even hits, home runs, RBIs, total bases, fantasy points scored, you name it. You can pick more or less on those stat projections over at Prize Picks, And you can use code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100 in the Prize Picks app. Again, that's locked on MLB on the Prize Picks app for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Third and final segment of Locked on Tigers. I appreciate you all so much for tuning in as always. So we've talked about the, the ball game. We're on to off the field things at this point. She talked a little bit about Dylan Dingler, his major league debut uh, roster move wise. Before this game started, they obviously called up Dingler, but there was a lot more going on outside of that as well. Casey Mize moved from the third, from the 30 day, from the 15 day, to the 60-day injured list. Now, the the immediate like misconception with the 60-day IL, it, it's all retroactive, right? And that's something that every single fan base, every single time someone who's been hurt is moved from the 15-day to the 60. Everybody freaks out and goes, oh my goodness. It's like, well, he's been on the IL for 58 days. So like he's still back in two days, you know, regardless. Now, that's not quite the case with Mize. Uh, he's been on the IL for just, I think, a tick under 30 days. I think it's like 28-ish, 27-ish days on the injured list. So he's a little bit under halfway through. That is still a pretty substantial chunk of time, especially considering that would be, what, two stints-ish on the 15-day IL. Uh, he didn't seem too happy about it. And this was something that our fantastic beat writers – Covered a lot about, put some quotes out there. I know Evan Petzold of the Free did. I know Cody Stavenhagen of The Athletic did as well. I'm sure, honestly, all the beat writers were all over it. And I just didn't see all of them necessarily. But um, he didn't seem too thrilled about it. He said that he he wants to go out there and pitch. And uh, that he thought he could have been back well before that. And then when AJ Hinch talked about it, he said, I think he used the phrase photo finish to get back by the end of of the next 15 day stint. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, this is now a, a weird thing where you, you have this situation you have in the off season where they like, you know, argued and, and uh, about like the arbitration numbers and whatnot. Over, and where there was a contract dispute over like, what was it? 15 or 20 or $30,000. It wasn't very much money. All things considered, you know, relative to baseball contracts at least. And, uh, it's just it's been it's been odd. So I'm hoping that he can come back. But again, it's not an arm injury, which is why it is weird to me that he's moved to the 60 day. Like he, we're, we're, he's still he's not even halfway through his IL stint because of a hamstring injury as a pitcher. Like Parker Meadows plays center field and is on a rehab assignment for a hamstring injury. Again, I'm not a doctor. Maybe one's way worse than the other. I'm not sure. Just my eyes saw that and observed that and thought it was kind of weird. Uh, so we have Ryan Kreidler back to the majors, obviously, uh, started on Monday night, uh, Baez put on the bereavement list. Hope everything's okay. He has a family emergency apparently that he had to go take care of, obviously hoping everything is okay involving him and his family and that situation, whatever comes out of it. So then Salmon is promoted again, obviously pitched over seven innings and Easton Lucas is sent down to triple a the tigers did make a small trade as well on monday ricky venasco from the dodgers for cash so uh ricky here was dfa'd by the dodgers and so he was on waivers and the tigers opted to trade for him rather than hope that he makes it to them on the waiver wire in their waiver priority because the Tigers aren't at the very top of that list. So now other teams would have had an opportunity to claim him. They said, why don't we just give you some cash and you can just give them to us. And that's what ended up happening. This is very similar to the Eddie's Leonard situation. Leonard, uh, the Dodgers had no room, you know, right around the trade deadline last year because they were acquiring a lot of pieces. They had to get rid of somebody on their 40 man roster. They chose that he's Leonard. He's now a Tiger. That's very similar to what's happening here with the Dodgers, with Ricky Venasco. Uh, he has really good stuff, and that is why the Tigers are taking a chance on him and why they wanted to ensure 
that they would bring him in. Uh, he's got a fastball that's like mid nineties and at times has touched well higher, really good, good meaning movement, uh, really sharp. I'll say is the terminology I'm going to use instead. We'll get to his faults here in a second. Um, really sharp slider, really sharp curveball. And uh, again, I always like having those two be separate pitches, kind of older school in that sense. I, I, I understand the sweeper. I like the sweeper. If you have it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but I do like having two separate breaking balls there. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of spin and there's a lot of velocity. So why did the Dodgers let him go? He walks everybody. And that is the issue that he has had so far. Uh, not only for the Dodgers at the major league level, but also in AAA for LA as well. Uh, I think his walk per nine was over eight this season or something like that. It's, it, it has not been great. And like, again, has the potential to get swing and miss stuff, has the, the, the stuff to execute, but um, just hasn't been hitting his spots, has been walking a lot of batters, has not been filling up the strike zone a ton, especially with his secondary pitches. That's something that a lot of different sources that covered this trade and have talked about Benasco in his career have cited the secondary stuff specifically is kind of sporadic and kind of all over the place. So he's been sent to AAA. He's not, we didn't trade him and put him in the major league bullpen immediately. I'm fine with the addition. It's for cash consideration, guys. I, I, like, if he doesn't work out, okay. Not my money is gone. Oh no, like it's it's fine. It's probably also not very much money, all things considered. Um, the, the the Dodgers have absolutely zero leverage in that situation. So, I'm fine with the addition. I'm fine with taking a risk, especially with how this organization has successfully developed pitchers over the last few years, obviously Fetter, Lund, Nieves, Revis down in the minors, you name it. Uh, everybody that's involved in that situation and, uh, and and that side of the development has done a great job. I'm okay adding a guy with stuff, but we also know that it's not a sure thing. Alex Lang still has not figured out how to throw strikes consistently. Cater Montero has been very inconsistent, albeit early on into his career. Um, so it's going to take time regardless. He's not just going to show up here and overnight be, you know, the, the best pitcher we have. Well, certainly now with Scooble in the mix, but you get my point. Um, but uh, I, again, for cash considerations, our 40 man is a lot worse than the Dodgers. I'm okay with him being a part of this organization. I'm okay with the move. So let's talk deadline day. It is currently a little bit after 10 PM. So if a trade happens, I don't, I don't know what I do. I will lose it. If they make a trade at like 1130, and then you never even see this episode because I have to re-record the whole thing. So I'm honestly hoping at this point, from from, from a a my job perspective, that they just wait until Tuesday. Um, we'll see what happens. I, I, at this point, I would be stunned if Jack Flaherty was a Tiger at 6:01 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. The deadline obviously being six o'clock uh, today, as you're listening to this on the 30th. I would be really surprised if Flaherty was still on the team. Uh, he was scratched from Monday's start, obviously. Uh, Evan Petzold of the free reported that the asking price for Flaherty has been very high. There's a few reasons for that. One, as starting pitchers go off the market, Flaherty becomes one of the best starting pitchers left. So I'm assuming that there's hopes that they can drive up the price that way. But also the Tigers have the leverage piece of saying if you do not offer us good enough prospects, we will just offer Flaherty a qualifying offer this fall. And if he doesn't accept it, then the Tigers get an extra draft pick at the end of the first round. That should net them a pretty decent prospect. So if you're not giving us a prospect that's better than presumably the guy we would take at that spot, then uh, no dice type of thing. That's That's all great. My thing is, let's not regurgitate last year. You know, like let's, and, and I'm not saying that's going to happen. Okay. Time will tell. Maybe we, we go out there and this front office and Harris are able to flip Flaherty for a phenomenal return. And, and we're talking at this time tomorrow and I'm doing, you know, backflips and, and talking about how great I think the return is. That's very much on the table. I'm not saying what I think will happen in this specific case. I'm just saying don't let what happened last year happen again. And, and Flaherty doesn't have a no trade clause. Okay. I'm not talking about that specifically, but like they waited and waited and waited until the last possible second with Erod and it bit him. Right. 
it, it really costs them to wait. Like, significantly costs them. Like, catastrophically costs them. So, don't get caught just twiddling your thumbs and then, you know, the, there's all these conversations, last possible second, we're going to wait to drive up the price, and then everybody just goes a different direction and all of a sudden you're left sitting there going, okay, well, I didn't take advantage while the market was at its hottest. Don't do that. Please, for the love of everything, do not do that. That uh, I'm not saying it will. I'm just saying don't. Don't let it. Um, other players I could see move outside of Flaherty. Uh, I really am becoming more and more convinced that Andy Abanez is going to get flipped. It's going to make me cry like a baby on air. Uh, but I do think that uh, a guy who crushes lefties and can play so many different positions is going to have a market. I, I really do believe that. And uh, I'm very interested in seeing if that ends up happening. I also am weirdly confident that Andrew Chafin gets moved just because of where he's at in his career and how good he's been over the last month and a half and the fact that he's a lefty and the fact that he can get swings and misses. All of those things considered, I, I really think that there's there, there kind of has to be a market for Chafin, so I would expect that. Really, uh, as I said yesterday, anybody in this bullpen could get moved and it wouldn't really be the most surprising thing in the world to me. Relievers are like that. Any of them can you know find value somewhere else or... I, and we don't have like a, oh, this guy's an untouchable dominant reliever. So like that, yeah, literally any of them could. Wouldn't be the most shocking thing in the world to me. Um, and I think that like, that's pretty much it. Like, again, like who you think Zach McKinstry is going to get traded? Like who else on the offensive side of the ball? Uh, nobody, dude. Like look at, again, look at the lineup we just rolled out there on Monday. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Also want to end on this note, uh, Alex Avila and Andy Dirks will uh, reportedly, Tony Paul of the Detroit News, um, will be reportedly a part of the Bally Sports Detroit rotation on TV, which I think is great. Uh, Dirks has done, I think, a great job on the radio. And Alex Avila has been getting work. Did I say Al Avila? Alex. It's Alex. Uh, Alex Avila has been getting work uh, with MLB Network. He apparently will still be doing work with MLB Network. Um, but uh, it's going to be a part of the rotation. He's a great on-air personality. I think that's a fantastic addition. Um, we've talked about the Craig Monroe situation a few times on this show, obviously. Uh, and then Carlos Pena, I, I just wasn't scheduled for that many games going into the year. So between those two things, um, the, you know, Petrie's getting a lot more work than I think they initially thought. They want to add some pieces because I don't think Monroe is coming back. Again, we've talked about that situation a lot. And so I think these are welcome additions. I think these are two uh, guys that uh, most of the fan base seems to, to like and, and think that are doing a pretty good job in their current roles. And I'm pumped to see them on TV. It's kind of a cool thing. Okay, Tigers play a day game today. Trade deadline's at 6. Uh, Gavin Williams against TBD. Uh, again, I have no clue who's going to pitch on a daily basis. The only time I know who's pitching is when it's Montero or Scooble. Outside of that... Uh, your guess is as good as mine, genuinely. Like, whoever you say, I'm going to be like, yeah, well, there's a chance it's probably them. Yeah, sure. Like, I I, I literally have no clue. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. Obviously, it being trade deadline day, even throws a little bit more of a wrench into who it could or couldn't be. Um, but you need innings very badly. And as it stands right now, I have zero idea where you are getting those. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. I appreciate you all greatly. We'll, of course, be back tomorrow. Again, talking about the trade deadline, talking about what happens on the field. We do have an off day on Wednesday, so we have a little bit of time to digest everything and kind of move some things around if we do need, depending on whatever. Whatever the biggest story is tomorrow, that's what we'll talk about. But we have a couple of days to go over everything. Also, be sure to make Locked On MLB your second Listen, host Paul Sullivan, a.k.a. Sully, is here to provide daily national expertise with his trademark humor to help you get ready for the MLB playoffs and the trade deadline and so much more this summer. Again, available on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast, Locked On MLB. Sully's a great guy. I've been a guest on his show plenty of times over the years. Um, I think that's it. I'm going to get out of here. Shorter than yesterday, today's episode, but still a little bit long. Appreciate you all greatly. Let's have a day, all right? It's going to be a busy one. Peace and love. Going to therapy's dope. I'll catch you all tomorrow. Go Tigers.